So with that, I would like to welcome our panelists. We have Meredith Nunn-Cohoven, we have Molly Aronowitz, and we have Morgan Jennings. Meredith farms with her father down in Southern Iowa. Marley, uh, excuse me, Molly Aronowitz and I work closely together on our landowner coaching program. Uh, Molly is from Peoples and is a farm manager there. And then Morgan Jennings is our field crops viability coordinator. So she um, does a lot of work with our cost share programming and also is someone who is here to answer any and all questions about field crops. And with that, I will pass it over to Meredith. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Meredith Nenikoven. Again, I farm with my dad down in Southeast Iowa in Mahaska County. Uh, we're between Oskaloosa and Ottumwa, Fremont area. Um, I often get told we kind of farm in the Mekong Delta of, of dirt. Uh, we have very good soil here um, on our particular uh, farmstead. Um, we currently have 250 tillable acres in corn and soy rotation with cover crops uh, balanced in there. We have uh, 100 acres in the um, CRP program. We can talk more about that. Six acres in chestnuts, three acres in fresh cut flowers, which is my business. I do uh, operate and manage an Airbnb. It's a three bed, two bed house. Uh, two bath house. And then um, I personally lease. Um, how I learned about row crop farming was leasing just five acres of land uh, that's really close to our farm. Um, so yeah, that's me. Great. And Molly, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, happy to be here with you today and and thanks to PFI for this opportunity to connect. Um, I grew up on a farm in northeast Iowa. Um, I can remember helping my dad with pig chores when I was little but the pigs were gone probably in the early 90s um, and so we're all corn and soybean farming and um, my dad is the fourth generation um, to work full-time on the farm. My brother and I will be the first generation not farm this uh, family ground ourselves and so um, navigating um, how to how to actively participate in the operation um, moving forward and in, in what that transition plan looks like. Um, my dad um, started working with a young farmer a couple years ago and he now lives on um, the home farm. Um, I actually never lived out on the farm because my mom was a city girl and, um, and never wanted to live out in the country. Um, and so as um, my dad transitions to retiring, whatever that means for, you know, do farmers really ever retire? Um, we will work more closely with this, with this beginning farmer, um, young, he's not beginning, a younger farmer. Um, and figure out what that that means um, for our family. Um, I went to Iowa State um, and have a degree in horticulture and specifically I wanted to work in public gardens. Um, and so I spent my 20s working in gardens from more urban to rural. Um, I worked in downtown Chicago at Millennium Park, um, birds and gardens in downtown Omaha and then a small arboretum in um, Northeast Iowa. And, um, you know, my, my public garden work was, you know, to tend to a landscape and then turn around and look at my audience and say, hey, this is what you're looking at. And then, hey, this is why this is cool and why it relates to you. Um, and that's really the same with farm management. Um, I've been working at People's Company for about 10 years, assisting non-farming landowners um, with finding a tenant, executing a lease, and then just completing those on-farm tasks as assigned. Um, People's Company is a farmland real estate company based in Iowa, based in Clive, um, when we can do real estate, farm management, farm appraisal work. Um, my approach to farm management is to really uh, look at how do we maximize production on the most productive acres 
while also protecting the natural resources on a farm. And then also in that larger working landscape. Um, when we start looking at production no notes and data points, um, we begin to learn where inputs, those farm inputs aren't eff efficiently transforming uh, to a cash crop and where they're not. And, and usually where we're losing money on a farm is also where there's an environmental concern. Um, in Iowa and the farms that I work on, it's usually around erosion or a drainage problem. Um, so by starting with those economic indicators, we usually in, uh, back into the environmental indicators. Um, and so, um, so knowing that we can start making um, changes to the farm, whether it's farming practices, conservation practices, um, or just pulling ground out of production altogether, taking those marginal acres out. Um, and so, and so that's the approach we take in farm management, but those same ideas, which we'll talk about here today, is what any landowner can do on their own. Um, and then the other plug is this, uh, if you would want more assistance, is this landowner coaching program um, hosted by PFI and that I assist with. It's uh, two one-hour online sessions. We do an intro session where I learn about um, uh, each landowner and their farm. And then I um, do a desktop review and provide more information. And then we have a follow-up meeting to give some um, real doable kind of bite-sized next steps. Um, and that is free to landowners in Iowa and would encourage you to, to um, visit PFI website to learn more if it was of interest. Thank you, Molly. And Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Martha. So as Martha said, I'm Morgan Jennings, and I am one of three field crop viability coordinators with PFI. And my position really focuses on helping farmers with diversified crop rotations or helping them adopt cover crops through some of our cost share programs. And a little bit of background about me is that I am an Iowa native. I did my undergrad study at Iowa State University and got a degree in animal science and agronomy. And then I continued my education at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and earned my master's degree, which really focused on cattle management and systems with limited, limited perennial pasture. And part of that research was looking at spring corn residue grazing and impacts on soil physical properties. So that was really interesting and a lot of fun. I find that fascinating and the soil is really important. So I guess that's just a little bit about me. I'm gonna just highlight probably really quick on just some ways that small grains and cover crops are great and then just touch on our programs. And then if there's more questions, we can get into de more details later. But it was really hard to choose what to say because there's definitely a lot of benefits. But if I had to choose a few to say about cover, cr cover crops and small grains together, I would first say that you're having something actively growing in the soil and you have living roots, you have the ground covered. So erosion control is huge that you have protection from wind and water erosion. So that would be the first thing I say about them. And then second would be that you're able to control weeds. And especially with adding a small grain to your rotation and you're able to build a more resilient system because they help break up those pest cycles if it's insects, weeds, diseases, things of that nature. But along with the erosion control and weed control, there's just a lot of other soil health benefits as well. And I think the biggest one is you're increasing your microbial diversity in the soil. And that's really important because that just kind of leads into a ripple effect of all these other benefits. So basically these microbes essentially exude this biological glue that helps hold the soil together. And a big part of that is that the soil then has this pore space for water and air. So plants can easily uptake nutrients and water and grow better. And then that just leads to better infiltration and you can have improved water quality because there's less runoff, 
but there's just a lot of benefits that can lead to having these in your system. And I guess I will say something that I heard the other day from Iowa's state soil health specialist, Hillary Olson. Um, I'll paraphrase. She she was kind of saying that, you know, if you were to eat the same thing every day for a year, like burger and fries, you'd be the healthiest that you could be. Unfortunately, no, like you can't just live off of that for, for the rest of your life. But that same concept can be applied to microbes in the soil. If we're constantly feeding them corn and beans and corn beans, they're not going to be as healthy as they could be. So when you incorporate a cover crop or a small grain into your rotation, people, you benefit the soil, have good soil health and benefit your system overall. So I just thought that was really interesting and wanted to share it with all of you because I think that kind of puts it into perspective and was a neat way to to view it. But I guess um, to jump into some of PFI's programs, um, currently we have opened the small grains caution and there you can earn $20 per acre on up to 200 acres for growing a small grain. So that could be rye, oats, barley, wheat, triticale, And then harvest that as a grain or forage in 2023 and follow that with a legume cover crop. And some examples of legumes are like clover, beans, peas. Those are pretty common. And then on top of that, you can earn $20 for reducing your nitrogen application. So I'll probably go ahead and once I finish speaking, put chats in or put links in the chat. So that way you guys can visit those sites for more program details. But that one's open right now. And I will also say any Iowa farmers eligible, if you're in Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, you're also eligible for the small grains kosher. And then cover crop is a little different. Still all Iowa farmers are eligible along with Illinois, Missouri, and then Nebraska and Southeast South Dakota. And we're still finalizing some details on that program, but we expect it to be pretty similar to last year's where we're going to, we should be seeing something like paying $10 per acre on unlimited acres. And just to touch on a few things about that, any farmer with any experience level is eligible to participate in that program. We have people who are just starting to get into cover crops and others who've been doing cover crops for a decade. So nothing restricts you from joining that way. You are allowed to double dip this program with other publicly funded programs as well. And we don't have any specific seeding date or rate guidelines um, that would affect eligibility. So that's a few things about the cover crop cost share. And I guess one last thing that I'll mention is that you just heard from Molly and I have worked with her several times already because for this program, landowners have the option to enroll in the program themselves and do the minimal paperwork that we have, like signing the contract and then showing receipts um, to show what cover crop acres that you seeded. So landowners can do it themselves or your farm manager can be listed as a primary contact and can handle all of that for you. So Molly, I worked with um, when I needed to clear information on fields. I just solely go through her. So we're pretty flexible on if, yeah, it's the tenant that wants to do that information or if you want your manager to be in charge. So um, with that, I think I'll go ahead and just put some links that so that way you guys can have all that information and I will turn it back to Martha. Thank you, Morgan. So what we're going to do is we're just going to ask some questions of our panelists, but we'd also love everyone right now to go ahead. And if you have some specific questions, go ahead and type those in the chat box. Um, And so that we can really get a feel for what are the things that you are interested in learning about today and make sure that we hit on those as well. And I'm pausing dramatically to see if uh, anybody starts typing in some questions. All right, so um, I really wanted to just get started. You know, a lot of landowners that I talk with have questions about rental rates. And we know that rental rates are certainly tied to the quality of the land that you have. Um, But how does a landowner know what that is? So do I know, you know, I I inherited some farmland. How do I know if it's good for corn and soybeans? What are some things that a tenant is going to be looking for that would help uh, determine that rental rate?
Well, <laughs> I'll speak up. I mean, from a farmer's perspective, so we're working on both sides. I have some um, land in my mom's name. I work with my aunts on that. And we're raising the rental rates because of the current prices. Um, the rental rate is based on the CSR rating. And Morgan and Molly can talk more about what that means. But the ground is a little bit um, lacking in, in good organic soil. So it's lower, it's lower um, when the contract we renewed it just this year because of the raise in prices, we raised the rental rate. So it could be very simple like that. Um, you could also have a really great tenant that you really trust and, and um, different, there's different rates for different ways that you work with them. If you have a flex lease, maybe you have a baseline uh, rental rate and as yields go up, then you both win. Um, there's a lot of information on flex leases. So uh, those are really two basic examples that could be applied um, when thinking about what rates could or should be for you. And um, I jump in just when, I, um, when I'm looking at a new farm to um, rent um, to a new tenant, when I'm, when I'm talking about a farm with the landowner, um, definitely corn suitability rating that Meredith mentioned is always first top of mind. Um, and corn suitability rating is at CSR two um, on a scale of zero to 100 and all soils in Iowa um, fall on that rating and every farm has a CSR two. Um, it, it, it doesn't tell the whole story of a farm, but it's at least that initial step of how to um, compare compare a farm to another. Um, and and so that that certainly plays into if, if it's a good farm to farm, but then also I um, from a rental perspective, um, what tenants often ask if they're looking to rent a new farm is um, what is the yield history on that farm? What um, what's the fertility, um, you know, is, has fertility been documented over time? Is the farm well drained? Um, is it maintained properly in field structures like waterways and terraces? Um, is it thinking about farmability? Um, is it one big field or a bunch of choppy kind of irregular shaped fields? Um, and, and, and then thinking about, um, is there good open communication between landowner and tenant where um, repairs are addressed um, in a timely fashion? Um, that, that's, the, that's the questions that I get asked probably most often. I'm curious with that, when you talk about well-drained, so we're talking about tiled usually, right? Uh, is there um, a way that, you know, if a, a tenant, um, I'm sorry, if a landowner is this inherited land, like how would they know if their land is tiled um, and or maybe the soil type to decide whether it's like well-drained soil or not well-drained soil, like just going from someone who really doesn't know anything, where do they find out this kind of information? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I'm coming in blind to a farm, maybe a landowner has just inherited it, um, or they've, they've purchased a farm where the tenant is long-term. Gosh, that tenant knows where the tile is better than anybody. So that's always a huge, huge um, asset. Um, but I think um, definitely tile, figuring out where it is, or I'll call all the local tile contractors and say, did you by chance tile the Smith farm in the last 20 years? And you'd be amazed at what those guys remember. Um, but also just general drainage of, you know, how the, how the land lays and how water is uh, able to get off the farm, um, whether there's good waterways in place or we have big cuts in a field. 
So like when you're looking at the field as it's starting, you know, as you're starting to see like corn or soybeans come up, you can really see the wet spots in the field, right? Yeah, you can see a lot. You can tell a lot about a farm before the crops in the ground, you know, the snow's melted and like right now going out on a field and seeing where the water wants to go and where it is going. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I'm curious, like, what are the red flags um, that are in the field that tell you as you're looking at it, wow, I think this is an area where we might need some conservation practices, or this is a place where, like, this area might be better suited for conservation, um, or, um, you know, the farmer may not be making any money on that land because they're putting all this money into the fertilizer that they're using and the seeds they're using, but that can affect your CSR rating, right? You want to bump up that yield history from the land? Am I, am I even saying that right? Um, you can't, you can't change a farm CSR to um, whatever you, whatever farming practices doesn't, isn't taken into account in that math. Um, it's soil types, to topography, weather. I think mm -hmm. a long calculation um, that I'm not smart enough to understand. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, that's like a, a great example of, um, and I think somebody, somebody spoke to this in the comments of um, like a CSR2 rating is like the value of a car going off the lot for the first time and then 20 years passes has the farm been well well maintained you know we're still valuing a farm on the off farm off lot price when a lot could happen over the life of a farm um, you could improve it um or you could you know make it worse by your farming practices so I think I was thinking of like the like the annual yields can increase if you're taking certain land out, right? We talk about precision agriculture, but I can you explain that a little bit more? How actually putting some of your land into conservation practices could help uh, your farmer as well as uh, the landowner. I don't mean to uh, to take all the time, Meredith and Morgan, if you want to hop in. I have lots of thoughts on this, but I can let you go first. <laughs> we talk about this all the time, a marginal ground. Why would you throw expensive inputs on ground that just isn't gonna produce um, those, you know, every, every field has those handful of marginal acres that we should all be probably taking a closer look at. And those marginal acres are probably where we have um, a conservation concern. And if, so if you, you can either address, maybe you um, add a cover crop on erodible ground or you, um, you know, address a drainage concern, but it could be that just taking those acres out of production is the best long-term answer. And if you were to take those acres out of production, your overall field yield average could increase and increased field yield average is what we all want. And, and you could, you could, you know, that translates to more yield, which should translate to a higher rent rate um, down the way if you can if you can document that um, document that over time. Yeah, I mean, let me know too if I'm cutting out and I can turn my video off. But, um, you know, like when we first started with cover crops to see the result, it took us 10 years. And my dad always says, we don't skip on inputs. So we make sure we're soil testing consecutively, you know, at least every four years, if not every, after every rotation, which means after corn and soy. Um, that's, that's how you can really watch your margins on those inputs. Um, if you're working with a seed and chemical advisor, but if, if you skimp on your, on your inputs, it will take you tenfold time to make that up versus staying on top of it and maybe giving a little more if necessary, if you know, it needs, it. so if it needs more lime, more potash, um, we th threw chicken manure on one year. It was excellent. Chicken manure can stay in the ground for a long time. 
yes, there's weeds that come with it, but we have a chicken farm five miles from us. So it works for us. It's close. Um, it's a different input. So for us, we just don't get behind on skimping. And if you have a tenant, um, you can write things in the contract and the lease to hold them accountable as well. You can monitor their your, um, yields and soil tests if you want. Um, that would have to be in your contract. But um, yeah, again, we don't get behind. We make sure we know what's going into the ground and what's coming out of the ground. So within a year or two, you would know what your yield is, especially compared to other farmers. So if your yield is super low compared to the guy right next to you, talk to him, ask him, ask him or her, what's your yield? Why is our yield, do you think like this? Did you notice anything that happened? Uh, <laughs> you know, in the last couple of years, while I may or may not have been here, um, having just open conversations with your neighbor can go a really long way. And the ground shouldn't change that much, you know, from someone that you, you can see across the road, but it may, it may a little bit, but um, that, that can be worth its weight in gold. Let's talk about yields. So I know that yields can vary depending on where you're at in Iowa or what type of ground you have. But generally speaking, for someone who doesn't farm, like what's going to sound like a good yield, what's not, and then how can they find out uh, these kinds of numbers? Is it just talking to their tenant? Anyone? I mean, I don't know, Molly, what kind of yields are you making on your farm? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I always like to benchmark by Iowa State County average yield. Um, so that's a point I um, I follow every year when that data comes out. So you could like um, Google um, Iowa State um, yields per county and probably find yeah. those numbers. Yep, we can find that and put it in the notes. I can. I think I have it bookmarked. Um, yeah, that comes out every year and they just announced 2022, I think. I think I just saw that come through my email. So I'm looking at that. Um, and that's this is just another reason why to collect data over time is um, fertilize for a landowner to collect data so they have, they can start, um, you know, seeing the trends there. Um, I think, yeah, probably going off the county data is a real good starting point. And I'll put that in the, I'll and, put that in there. Yeah, and keeping track of your own yields, right, Molly, over time, like yes, we've seen fields increase from 190 to 200 to 210 to 220 in corn yield. That's yield per bushel, right? Beans would be, um, if you're between uh, 50 and 65, those are really good yields, especially down in Southeast Iowa, we had, here in Mahaska County, two years of consecutive severe drought, and we were still over 200 bushel corn on one of our fields. And we attribute that to cover crops, we attribute that to our inputs, and uh, we attribute that to just really watching what we're doing in the last 10 years time. I don't know if that would have happened prior to this. It's, it's hard to know. Sometimes but with the drought, it can affect both types of crops. Soy tends to love heat, um, but, um, yeah, if you're in those ranges, you're doing quite well. Great. All right. Well, well, my next question for everyone is just trying to better understand what's going on in the field through the year. So at the very basic, we understand that the crop gets planted and the crop gets harvested, but what else is a farmer going to be doing? Let's say within a, a year that they're planting corn. What are some things that the, the tenant will be doing throughout the year? I guess what's required of them. <laughs> <laughs> so in the spring, what's happening, what's happening um, with, I mean, I assume that at some point they need to be um, ordering corn seed, like what time of year do they start thinking about that? What time of year do they start thinking if they are going to be planting cover crops? Uh, of course, they need to get out into the field, but are they are they plowing first and then planting? Uh, if after planting, like when does the fertilizing happen? Like, can somebody talk me through what that might look like in a year? Yes. Yeah, so on the on the farms that I crop share or cost custom, 
Um, I'm usually thinking about fertilizer for the next year, um, the fall before. So right after, I'm probably thinking about, I'm looking at soil tests, I'm thinking about the yield in the field, and then I'm starting to make plans, you know, in um, August and September of what fertilizer I'm going to spread for the next year. And depending on the situation in the tenant, maybe that fertilizer is spread in the fall um, or, or in the spring, um, that next spring. But I'm kind of booking fertilizer and hydrus the fall before the crop. And I'm also thinking about seed. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm typically, you know, putting money down for those inputs in the fall and then, um, or having a plan of when I have to put the money down and then um, putting money down on seed um, at um, usually, or, or sorry, putting money down for chemical uh, in the first quarter of the year. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we're getting tenants to move toward reduced tillage or no tillage. Um, a conventional farmer will be, you know, there'll be fall tillage um, and, and then probably spring tillage too. Um, and hopefully we're getting guys, guys and gals um, moved away from that. Um, and then, and then, man, guys are, are everybody's getting antsy right about now. I mean, we're a couple of weeks out to really running, um, and then it's um, then it's thinking about getting ready for spray, spraying, terminating a cover crop, or or just doing a pre pre pass before planting. And a pre pass planting, working up the ground. A chemical pass, yeah. um, but hopefully they're planting cover crops in the fall too. Mm -hmm. That's in there. So then they're going in, they're planting, and then how much more will that farmer go into the field before they um, uh, they harvest again in the fall? What kinds of things are happening in the in between time? So you could see another you could see another chemical pass for weed, and then you could see a pass, one or two passes for crop protection. Um, and this is I'm just kind of general, um, you know, more traditional, you know, uh, farming. Um, so you could see, you could see two passes, the chemical passes of weed um, protection and then a crop protection and maybe a fungicide or insecticide maybe um, before harvest. And hopefully, okay. hopefully if those passes are happening, Hopefully it's more um, that they're field scouting, they see a problem and they're addressing it versus of using that chemical pass as, um, as just insurance of that they do a fungicide every year. Um, and what's crop and protection? It, that's kind of my general crop protection. I think of that as weed, disease, insect. Um, and then a good point somebody just said in the comments, um, side dress, if you're gonna dribble on your nitrogen, spoon feed your nitrogen on too, then you'd see that pass. And some of those could be combined. Yeah, yeah just to echo what Molly said as well, I, I would not be afraid to get out and look at your fields. Someone told me that they call that goal, get out and look and see what pests that you have or weeds. So it's a lot easier to see what you're dealing with. Um, I mean, I, I understand the the idea of the preventative measures rather than, than treating, but I would definitely encourage farmers to be getting out and scouting their, their fields as well throughout the year. And then finally, I just asked some questions about tillage. We've been talking about tillage. What are the different kinds of tillage for someone who is not familiar with farming? And when they're looking out into the field, like what are they going to be seeing to know which kinds of tillage might be happening on their place? I mean, <laughs> it's going to depend on your dirt, right? And what you're working with but also like no till 
you know, you could start no-till and work into it. Um, we have slowly worked into no-till from large plowing, like bringing up feet of dirt in the fall with a ripper. That's and my then, memory of like being a little yes. kid and watching my dad with the, the giant plow, just like the pioneers had more or less, right? Like yes. flipping it over. Yes. We don't see that a lot anymore, correct? Right. We, uh, for probably 15 years now, we've not exercise that in this unless we thought it was totally absolutely necessary so we're no longer ripping the ground and we've moved in the last 10-15 years into no-till so um, not everything's no-tilled we will do a little maybe fall conditioning we will do some stock chopping um, for better seed soil contact what um, is field conditioning field conditioning may be um, and it's kind of my dad's thing <laughs> he likes to run a a large piece of equipment called a field to chop up the stalks and kind of loose, barely loosen up the soil a little bit for that really nice seed soil contact. Okay. And we'll probably do that on corn ground from the previous year, right? Bean ground with no till right in, we have no issue because beans are smaller plants. They're more delicate and fragile. And over the winter months, they kind of break up organically, right? But your corn stalks are really meaty. They're like, you know, an inch wide and there's a lot of, lot of res. So it'll basically help to chop up that residue so that when the planter comes through, it's not getting uh, bottled up with, with all that extra corn silage, essentially. Um, you could have someone maybe chop your silage and, and bale it. That would also kind of a no-till practice. Um, but yeah, we, we may run that through in the spring if we think it's needed, but some for some planters, for some equipment, it's not. Um, it really does come down to the type of equipment that you may have and your ground. So we have the big giant um, old school plow, right? And then we have no-till, what's in between? You could be, um, you could be strip tilling where you're just working, you know, the furrow. Uh, you could be just working the furrow where you're gonna be planting um, and just different levels of, you could just kind of scratch the surface. Um, um, yeah, there's just kind of a lot of in between there. Um, and we're not even, I just noted there was a comment in here earlier about tillage for weed management in organic, and that's a whole nother, um, you know, we're just really kind of just conventional here. Um, um, and that's, that's like the big piece of when I, I work with landowners who, maybe have a sense of the tillage that's happening on their farm and they want to go to no-till and that's great. That's what we, we want to work with landowners that want to move to no-till. Um, but it's not an overnight process. You know, it's, it's not like you wake up one morning and say, we're going to be no-till. Um, there's a lot of pieces of the, you know, how the, the, all the pieces of a farming operation work together. Um, to make that and happen. What would some of those um, considerations be if you went to your tenant and you just said, okay, I'd love to be no-till. Like, what does that mean for the farmer? Obviously they have to buy new equipment, but there must be other elements to that as well. Maybe different seed. They might have to change their seed choice. Um, equipment is huge. Equipment is very expensive right now because of the hike in yield prices. So when yields go up, what goes up? equipment prices, you may have to um, custom farm or ask someone to help you with their type of equipment that they have. Um, we surprisingly like went right into it and dad was like, oh, this isn't so bad. And I was like, yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's actually working okay. You know, and I think that cover crop really helps. So I think the no-till and cover crop together are kind of magical. And I, I, I think, that that may be the hitch that you have if you're working with a tenant. I think if that that will be something. So the 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 cover crop could be that extra input, right? But you could work with someone like Morgan, who could help you with cover crop share uh, to ease that burden for that tenant. Um, I think both should should go together because if if you are compacting the soil with tractor passes, right, and you are wanting to no-till 
that cover crop will help a lot in, in opening up the ground and providing the right biology. Um, I, I do think that those two go together very nicely. Can you tell me more about what were the steps you took to take no-till, to, to convert to no-till, Meredith? Showing my dad we could make money on cover crops chair. <laughs> It's all the money for the old guys, right? Or old gals. It, it does. Like I show, like, you know, we, we signed up for cover crop programming um, through NRCS as well, through the government program. There's a lot of programming there. Um, these other match grants, sometimes you graduate out of that programming. So we've graduated out of that now. And it's nice to see these other programs there to continue to support what we do. Um, because our equipment has gotten older and phased out. So we have to have someone come in and, and plant our bean. We're, we're, um, we're customing that out. Um, someone does have to come in and drill in cereal rye. Um, so I, I would say the steps are, I, for me, I like to ease into things and not go whole hog, right? Uh, we do test strips sometimes in our fields just to show maybe the difference over time, over five, 10 years, what that may be like. I, I, I mean, some people are like, go whole hog, do it, all of it all at once. But we were, we just kind of eased every field into it over time. And eventually seeing is believing. And that was big for my dad. And so now we're seeing it. We're seeing those yields really stay strong and stable, especially through changes in temperature and big seasonal, you know, waves of adjustment through droughts or, or heavy monsoon rains like we had a couple of years ago. That's awesome. So Morgan, I'm curious if someone comes to you who's a landowner and says, man, I'm hearing about cover crops, I'm hearing about no-till, like I'm interested in doing this with my tenant, what are some recommendations that you would have for just helping them get started um, in the process? Yeah, so I know something that we have for sure at PFI is find cover crops app. And that definitely connects you with how to get your how to get your seed and um, so that's a good starting point, potentially. I know that there's a lot or there's opportunities for people to reach out to like neighbors or other farmers that have seed and get seed from them to plant. And you don't necessarily need to go out and buy your own. Um, and I guess, sorry, I'm getting mildly distracted because I am seeing all these chats pop up somewhat. Patricia, you asked a while ago, and I kind of want to address it about cover crops, um, the best how are cover crops best killed when the time comes? And there's definitely a lot of options for, for that. And I think when you are doing cover crops, you really just got to think about the goals that you're trying to address. But in regards to terminating, you could potentially do it early. So you'd be looking at a couple weeks before planting. And that might be a, a good option if the equipment that you do have can't handle a lot of the biomass of the cover crops. Um, I guess a drawback to that would be you're, you're terminating it early. So then you're the carbon source for the microbes ends early. But again, if you are terminating early, you can have faster decomposition and nutrient cycling and get some of those benefits. Um, but along with early, you can have late and that would be your terminating your, your cover crop at the, at the time of planting or afterwards. So that means that the cover crop would be well into the reproductive stage at that point. And that's also known as planting green. Um, and you would get more carbon with that and happier soil biology. So that's always, that's a plus. Um, but then, yeah, there's there's a lot of other options too, like freeze kill. So that would be um, cold weather you're relying on to terminate the cover crop and help. We've talked about tillage already. You can use that to break up the roots and kill the cover crop. And I think another other pretty popular option is roller crimping. And that's nice because it is nice to the soil. And um, you don't have to use tillage or herbicide. It's just essentially breaking that stem. So then like the plant can't uptake water and nutrients anymore. So that, so if that's your goal and you don't want to use chemical, then, then that's another option. But chemical is a pretty common thing for non-organic farmers, I would say. Um, other than that, I think that's a lot of the options I can think of the top of my head for how they're best killed. Um, 
because any of those are are viable options. It really is just what you have and what you want to use. Um, I know that some some farmers can can technically graze as well their livestock to terminate, but I know that can pose um, challenges as well if the cover crop is still in a vegetative stage, so it'll keep growing. Um, but yeah, that's I hope that answers your question, Patricia. But sorry, Martha, to to veer off a bit. No, I'm glad you answered it. In fact, we're just getting to the point where um, I am ready to turn it over to Emma, our tech guru for the day, who has been monitoring the questions in the chat box. Emma, would you like to share um, some questions from the audience? I sure would, Martha. Thank you. Uh, so one of the early questions was, um, we share a crop with our farmer and we split all the costs and income. However, our farmer claims we as landowners should pay for all the lime. So could you talk a little bit about cost breakdown between landowner and tenant, please? Could I interrupt and also just say, can you explain for everyone the difference between what lime would be versus other like fertilizers or inputs and how they're different? I, I can tell you how we do it on rented ground. Um, lime is to address pH of a farm, to raise the, raise the pH. Um, and this is something we, we, we try to get on a four-year schedule on soil testing. And, um, and then you can check in on, on things like pH to see um, if it is um, at adequate levels to grow a crop. Um, and when, when I'm working with a landowner and tenant and thinking about lime, um, I often, it, part of the conversation is how long the tenant has been on the farm. Um, if that tenant is new to the farm and they are not the cause of a lower pH, then often I'll talk to the landowner and say, you know, I think this is maybe something that should be your investment. Um, if the tenant's been on the farm for a long time on a, on a cash rent lease, um, I often say that I think it should be the tenant's investment. But if it is the tenant's investment, it's typically a four-year, something we would do every four years, kind of the same schedule as soil testing. And so um, we would sign an agreement that tenant's going to pay and make the investment in Lyme. But if they leave, um, if they leave after a year, we're going to reimburse um, for 75% of that Lyme cost. So appreciate it over four years. Um, and so um, if I'm in a long-term landowner tenant crop share, um, I and um, all things being equal, I would push back on that line. I think that that should be a shared, a shared investment. Um, there's of course a lot of other factors that could go into that. Um, Sometimes um, if it's fair with everything else that's working, um, sometimes um, on fertilizer and, and lime, we'll, I'll say that it's the landowner's investment to pay for the product and the tenant pays for trucking or app and or application. And so that's one way to split. Um, so with lime, you're talking about scenarios. a long-term Oh, I was going to say, so with, with Lyme, you're really talking about a long-term investment, right? It's something yeah. that you wouldn't do every year. Um, and mm -hmm. what kind of a pH number are you looking for? Is that like a, like at a six or a seven? Do I have that right? Mid sevens. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think yeah. about that, Meredith? I mean, our fact is like thumbs down, like what, like 50? the types of leases that you have with your farmers too, right, Molly? Like 50-50 of basic cash rent, flex leases, and some farming. So if they're a 50-50 farm, they're sharing 50-50 down the middle, right? Which could be of everything. So um, I think right now those leases can be very iffy, especially are. Um, I would be more in the flex lease custom farming arena. Um, but cash rent is a great way to start 
yes, inputs like Lyme are extremely important. We get really lucky on our farm because we're by a bunch of roads. So <laughs> the Lyme is actually really good close to the rock road. So our inputs are less right there versus on the other side. But I don't, for that situation, that's really tough. I don't know all the details. Yeah. Uh, but I'd really be curious to see what's in the, I totally agree with Molly, uh, stand up you know, stand up for yourself, um, have further conversations. And also maybe that's not the greatest relationship if they're starting to refuse on taking care of the ground in the world, taking care of you're the owner. So if you're the owner, you should have, you have power and say on how you want your land to be um, taken care of and operated on if you're working with a tenant. Should I pose another question? Yeah. All right. So somebody in the chat wanted to know a little bit more about the differences between organic and conventional production. Can you say that one more time, Emma? Sorry. I got dis distracted by the, the chat. <laughs> sure. So can you talk about the differences between organic versus conventional production, please? Um, I, I do almost all conventional, but I have had the pleasure of transitioning a traditional row crop farm um, just recently up by Mason City. Um, and, um, and it was, a, it was a farm that had been traditionally cash rented and the landowner and tenant agreed to transition to organic. And so we had to work through like, um, how does a lease look when um, when we're transitioning to organic? Um, and the big risk of that is that we we had to do that, you know, um, those years of transition, those transition crop years to get to our first certified organic year, um, which we just did in 2022. We had an organic corn crop. Um, and so I think the big, the big difference in the struggle is how do you weather those transition years, um, and how are you, how is the, how do the landowner and tenant work together, um, you know, and have a fair rental um, arrangement on those transition years, and then how do you move forward on the organic? The way that they did it was. Um, a crop share where the tenant paid for all inputs um, and the landowner just took a, a percentage of, of, of um, sales um, once the once it was sold. And the big piece was that we, the owner remained very involved in the documentation and the ownership of that certification. Um, and so that was the piece that they kind of brought to the table um, of doing the heavy lifting um, but it was a lot to learn of, of weed management with tillage, um, thinking about cover crops um, and um, how to use cover crops, a green manure, how to get, um, how to use, we were thankfully close to a, a chicken litter um, source. And so we were able to use that. Um, but it, it's a lot of thinking outside the box to manage weeds, get that, that fertility that you need. And then when all is said at the end of the day, at the end of the day, where to sell this, where to sell this organic crop. And that's, that's half the struggle too. Yeah, Molly, isn't it, isn't it true that your crop, it gets checked, right? So your crop could be rejected on organic terms, possibly. You could still sell it conventionally, but organically you may not get the same prices if it's not deemed as being what your end sales co-op deems it to be? Yeah, so we um, we worked very closely with an agronomist that specialized, specialized in organic production. And he helped us make sure that we had all the paperwork right all along the way. And we crossed our T's and dotted our I's um, and even and, um, and and made sure we were using the right inputs. Um, and and he said he said he's seen uh, 
loads, um, not taking at delivery because it could be as much as the dust on the covering um, from a, you know, you got to clean out all of your equipment when you're moving from um, conventional to organic and even just the dust in that, you know, in the delivery could could affect an organic test. So um, yeah, you got to be real careful <laughs> along the way. I would just mention for organic farmers too, um, you might have to rely more heavily on on tillage in order to handle the weeds. But if that's if you don't want to have to till because you're organic, then then yes, you might want to consider um, cover crops to help or incorporating that small grain like corn, beans, wheat, or something like that to help. I kind of touched on it earlier, but breaking up those weed cycles and pest cycles. So then you don't have to, you're not applying chemical and that can help alleviate. Yeah, like we're not organic, uh, but we do, an option could be for you, you could grow seed for a company. So we grow seed beans for none other than Pioneer Cortiva. Again, if you do that process, you could get rejected on your premium. That's a whole nother conversation if you want to reach out to us and talk about it. But we had a bin full of uh, seed beans that was rejected, 11, what, 8,000, and then 7,000 that was accepted. They were sitting right next to each other, came from the same field. And so then we had to sell the 8,000 bushel bin full of beans on our own. And the other one was a premium with it. And they come and vac it out. Okay. They come in, they come and unload it. You pay for the trucking fee. And I think part of the vacuuming of that, they vac out the all of all of seed beans out of half to haul it to town. And it's done very early in the season. Um, so you can like put that behind you and then haul your corn later on. Um, but that could be an option for another way to grow for someone in some way if you're doing um, I will move on if no further comments. Um, another question asked in the chat was, do you have a rule of thumb to translate a farm CSR to the cash rental rates on ag decision makers? So also definitions of any of those if they haven't been addressed yet. Isn't there an equation for that? Yeah, I think if I recall, so Iowa State posts um, an annual survey, cash rent survey showing the average rent uh, per county. Um, the only, caution I'd have with that is that some counties have very low participation where it's just a handful of survey you know that's making up that county average that they report so sometimes I look at the they also do it by region sometimes I look at the region um because you're pulling in more um more survey results and I'm I'm pretty sure on that survey when you look down, it'll give you an average rental rate per county, and then it'll tell you the average CSR2 to the county and do a price per point, where you just take their, their rental rate divided by the CSR2, and that's your price per point. And so you could use that price per point times your CSR2 to, to get a rental rate per acre um, to help you um, help you compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Again, go have conversations with neighbors. Someone nice nearby will help you, right? It, it, it would be really hard if you had the same ground, your neighbor's charging 400 and you're charging 200 and everyone's talking to you. There's a reason for that, right? You might need to up your, up your rate, you know, um, have conversations with people. I swear everywhere around me, all the renter rate, the rental rates are based on what everyone else is doing 
around them. So you don't want to price yourself out of the market, but you don't want to undersell yourself either. And sometimes knowing your yields and asking your tenant to close that in the contract, you know, over time where to take where to take that rental uh, contract with your tenant. Setting setting fair rent is the hardest part of my job, I'd say. It's just it's yeah. it's no fun. Uh, but I think the the big the the bigger item that I, I wish we'd focus more on, I mean annual cash return is is so important, but also we can't forget about long-term appreciation and, and thinking about um, you know, the long-term value of a farm is in its fertility and, and documentation of yield. Um, and so, you know, just to make sure that we continue to um, improve the farm and its fertility it's, um, and, and see improved yield, you know, to make the farm the best we can. Um, just to be collecting that, you know, I would I would pay a reduced rent every day if I could work with a really good tenant that understood my soil health goals um, and was willing to invest in in those practices that would address soil health. Um, that would that means a lot to me. Molly, do most of the um, tenants that and landowners that you work with just have a year to year? lease um, and when they're doing that do they set a new rate every year um, and do you have um, many written leases or a lot of it I know a lot of people and I would just operate on a handshake deal from year to year yeah yeah there is a lot of handshake agreements out there um, we're all written leases um, and they typically um, I do a lot of flex leases, so that base rent can move with the market, and then a bonus is paid at the end of the year if yield and our price exceed our expectations, and that's really helpful in volatile times, um, and, and so a lot of leases can roll over if, if the terms are still fair. Um, I think... Um, I like an annual lease because we are in these volatile times um, and, and that'll, you know, it makes sure that we're thinking and discussing that rental rate um, annually and um, thinking about the practices we want to incorporate on the farm annually. It's easy to, to have a long-term lease and just go on auto um, and not think about how, you know, those annual steps that you can take to improve a farm. It's just a real good check-in time. And when you're talking about a lease, you could talk about um, rental rate is an important part of a lease, but there's so many other things that you could add to that lease and that lease conversation to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Are there like three top things that you wish you could like add into a lease or like you're talking about flex leasing and something like that? Like uh, what are the advantages of that? with uh, landowners like in some ways like they might not make as much money every year but it seems like it can help them leverage uh, making some changes on their farm yeah, exactly exactly it um, and I guess the, the thing that I would say about a flex lease is that there's a hundred ways to ride them some of them are very complicated too complicated and so um if, if you've never done a flex lease before, I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out to um, you know, uh, Iowa State Extension, PFI, Landowner Coaching Program, something to talk through that because um, simple is better and there's just a lot of complicated formulas out there. But if I could pick three things to put in a farm lease, um, it would be an annual operator reporting requirement where the tenant sends in um, sends in yield data and fertilizer and chemical applied. Um, I'd include um, kind of a, a roadmap of expectations of, you know, a com somehow include notes about the conversation, the ongoing conversation that landowner and tenant is having about landowner of farm goals of maybe it's reducing tillage, um, maybe it's, you know, working to the place of, of having a cover crop 
before, you know, each fall and, and working towards maybe planting it green, you know. Um, and um, the third thing I think about is um, to make sure everybody's ad adequately insured um, that we are managing that risk. Um, that we require um, tenant to show um, liability insurance to a specific coverage rate. That's great. Emma, what are our next questions? All right, I got one more question in the queue. So again, I encourage people to type in the chat box if they have any more questions. Um, so one person wants to know kind of when the right time is to talk to a tenant about cover cropping, like for example, is now kind of too late to start thinking about spring cover crops or cover crops for the year? Um, are there any other practices that would be good to bring up um, before broaching cover cropping? I think PFI wants me to say there's always a good time to talk about cover crops anytime right probably in the winter months you know your contract renewals are what molly in the in september normally september 1st is your deadline to cancel a lease i mean i think that a good time, right in iowa so a good time probably would be when they have time right which for row croppers is in the winter months um but also a great time is to when you're putting them on an application in the field and checking them out or seeing how they're yielding, how the cover crops are doing um, either before termination or at application. Morgan might have some more thoughts on this, but for us, um, we're talking about covers all the time, every time between those who are tenants um, and my dad and I are talking about it all the time too. What can we do differently? Should we just have a termination crop this year? Should we spray less? I mean, as a farm family, it's it's on our mind all the time, even with our flower program. Um, Molly and I were just talking about cover crops in your garden. So I think their time, but just for the farmer, um, probably in the months where they're not actually you know, they're scaling, they're, they're looking at their budget for the year. Uh, those times in the win winter um, may be more suitable or, po or pre uh, previous that, that same year, they may be purchasing seed at a discount price that same year for the next year. You know, things like that um, may attract. I'm curious with this, we're talking a lot about cover crops and how awesome they are and no-till and how awesome it is, but we hear a lot from landowners who say, I brought up cover crops with my tenant and they said, it's not a good plan. So what's what's the, uh, can you help give us some insight into why it is that other farmers may feel like this is, is not a good fit for them or, you know, what is it about it that is, uh, might be the holdup? I don't know. I I hate to say this, unfortunately, they're like really good tenants, but that's a small percentage that are really going to talk to you all the time, be very open. A majority of tenants are in the game for, they might be in the game for the, the profit margins, right? The more that they have to do, the more work it is, the more money it is for them. So I think it has to be a contractual thing and possibly before they even start working with you, you set the foundation of this is how we farm and this is how I'd like to farm. But it doesn't always work out like that, right? You may have a tenant and there's no one else around, right? Or you have to custom crop with someone, they don't have the equipment or they can't get in at that time of year because of the weather conditions. So it's not, um, it's not always feasible for everyone, but tenants in majority are looking at their margins left and right. And because it's, it may seem like extra work for them, changing the mindset is really key. Like it's going to improve your yields, our yields, we're in it together, we're doing this together. Um, you know, I think it's the mindset. Yeah, because I mean, I would say that there are a lot of great tenants out there, but maybe they've just been doing it a certain way, right? And so it can be hard to understand why, um, why you want that change. 
Um, so it sounds like that that in in part of that, it just might be that they're changing up what they do, how they do it, but also it's like one more thing that they have to add into the mix. And then what I'm also hearing is it sounds like it's the 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 money that may be involved. So what are the, is there like a typical uh, split between landowner and tenant? Do tenants usually pay? Do landowners usually pay? Like what's a fair exchange there if you're going to start planting cover crops? I, and I would add as your, as your, the first part of your comments, Martha, about um, good tenants out there. Um, there's a lot of good tenants out there that are, are well-intentioned tenants that they're covering a thousand acres and the key to that game or, or any just large you know acreage the key to that game is consistency over all acres when it and and the weather variability that we see when um when it's time to go in the spring and when it's time to spray when it's time to plant we got to run and we don't stop until it's done and so having to stop because um you know something happens with a cover crop you know, that messes up, um, you know, something, just a bad spring and it, one field is messed up because of a cover crop, um, gosh, you're, you're, you're hesitant to try again um, because you had a really bad experience. And I think Grana was telling me once that, uh, that as we are figuring out cover crops and, and adding them into a farming operation, you know, if you do it for five, you, you, five years, you're most likely going to have one or two or hopefully not three years where you, something goes wrong. <laughs> it isn't, you know, that you're just learning as you go. Um, and that's how we're all farming. And uh, that learning as you go can have significant um, effects when you're trying to, you know, when you have a lot of acres to cover. Um, what are some of the things that can go wrong? Like how do how do adding cover crops into the mix change things up for those farmers? So I've had troubles. I had one year where we um, where we said across the board, you know, the landowner is going to pay for cover crops and um, we're going to fly them on. So it's no added um, no added item to do for the tenant. And so we flew it over beans um, and um, this one operation, the, um, the oats grew really well. They had perfect growing conditions. And by the time the tenant could harvest that field, the oats were taller than the beans and it was just a mess. Oh. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes you run into in the spring of the timing of that, of terminating that cover crop um, and, and planting your cash crop and um, just doing those tweaks um, of equipment to make sure that, you know, your the planting, um, your planting is set up how you want. There's so many, I hate to like focus on, on negative, but this, because there's so many great where it just works slick, but you always remember like the couple bad if, if you're, a, if, if you're a farmer who isn't fully bought into cover crops, and then you have a landowner who wants you to do it. Like one bad experience could really put a bad taste in your mouth. Uh, but it's helpful. I, it, it gives good perspective to help to help understand where those tenants are coming from. I worked with a landowner recently that that said she told me that she told her tenants, "I'm not going to tell you how to farm. That's your business. But I am going to tell you how to farm my farm and how I want it done on my farm. And um, you can either we can either work together or I can find a new tenant. And I just really appreciated that just kind of direct honesty. Um, and I feel like that's a lot of our problems is that we kind of know what we want to do on a farm, but we're not having that open communication and um, kind of having that direct business approach of um, how we want to do things on our farm. Change is always hard, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah where absolutely. we want to get to. It's not a year one thing, but this is where I want to be in three years. And we can either be on the same page or I need to find someone else. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it takes that time, right? That you don't see the advantages to the cover crop immediately. Meredith, it sounds like it's taken you almost 10 years to really start to feel all the benefits of the cover crop and the no-till. 
Yeah, so that's 10 years of my dad bickering, <laughs> right? You know, it's 10 years of, oh, this year uh, we can't get in to spray early, so we're going to have a hard time planting because it overgrew. We couldn't terminate it, you know, so we've finally we're seeing something and we're in the groove. You know, I'm not saying it's going to take 10 years for you. But for someone who has farmed since he was a child on the same farm, he's still on. It's, it's taken him a while. And I understand that, right? So as a daughter um, who's helping him, I have to be respectful. So I, I, I just shift the, the conversation, right? Okay, so if we don't do cereal rye, then let's just fly on oats, you know, and they'll terminate themselves in the winter. Done. It's still a cover we're still trying on we don't have to do a thing but pay the bill so maybe you know maybe those are some adjustments you make for your farm that make for your farm that work for you right and for my dad he loves he loves that right um so i morgan might have some more input with people she's worked with but um yeah it took time but we're there and we're doing okay love hearing that morgan yeah you have anything to add yeah all of this is great i'm trying to like follow along with what i've heard for for just starting with pfi in the fall and then just getting completely immersed in the cover crop cost share program since um that's what it is is seeding cover crops in the fall um to address kind of one of your first questions martha i feel like we have a decent amount of of tenants um landowners whatever that are are splitting the costs that um are 50 50 when i'm when i'm going through and verifying receipts um i think they've they've tended to to be a lesser amount of acres i guess um like if it was just 50 a 50 acre field and you know one takes care of 25 and the other takes care of the other 25 acres for for seed costs and then and then they have the option of splitting that check when when we send those payments out um it doesn't have to be one check just for for the contract holder it could be it could be multiple um so i feel like i definitely see i've seen a mix um in that regard um and then yeah just kind of thinking about like cover crops in general and i think it was carrie that had asked the that question in the chat that um we've had the frost seeding of cover crops that's already kind of taken place but then you can also be planting a summer cover crop as well that might be more more ideal to start looking into at this point um but then our program takes place in the fall and with that program opening soon i would say now is definitely the time to be talking talking to to all of the appropriate people and figuring out what you want to do, what you want to get planted, um, enroll those acres. I feel like I can't stress that part enough is kind of what Meredith has been has been saying the whole time is just talk to people. Um, we're all here and then just even talking to your local NRCS office and your local co-ops and just getting those resources and understanding what what seeds available to you or products as well like your your conservation agronomists are there to give you that information but yeah that's great well we're getting closer and closer to the end of our session emma do we have any more questions in the chat we do um so one landowner asked um my farmer didn't like the nitrogen guarantee program when i mentioned it um he said it sounded like insurance and is there um, a reply that um, they could give to them um, how to talk about like a nitrogen program. Morgan, can you explain what PFI is offering? This is a new program that's offered this year. Yes, and I'm actually not the right field crops viability coordinator to talk. I think you're referencing the yield warranty program that we have, um, and that's trying to cut your fertilizer in corn. Um, an enrollment for that actually ends this week. And you, I think, basically get 15 to $30 per acre, depending on um, the requirements. So once you, it's not a cost share, but yeah, once you, if your yield drops below a certain benchmark, then you end up getting paid for those acres um, or for, for that loss. And I would say, 
I don't want to go into too much detail on that just because that's that's not what I handle since I'm more of the cover crop cost share. Um, Chelsea Ferry is our other field crops viability coordinator that handles the fertilizer um, end of things. So um, I guess I can put my email, her email in as well. I don't, I guess I don't need to call her out, but um, I would say I can, if you want to email me and then I can put you in contact with the correct people when it comes to that yield warranty fertilizer side of things. But um, I understand uh, of the, it sounds more like insurance because yes. It, would there it, be it any reason why they shouldn't, would that somehow conflict with other crop insurance? Is that a potential reason why they wouldn't want the insurance or I guess it's, it's hard to know based on that question? Yeah, I don't, as far as I know, I don't think it, it conflicts with other, other crop insurance, but who, who asked that question? Cause I definitely would want to get you more information. Char, Charlene asked that question. Um, Why don't you Charlene. go ahead and, and uh, type, um, and do we have Chelsea's email maybe that we could put in the chat box? Yeah, I'll add, um, I'll that add way anybody who is interested in, in participating in that program could sign up through her. Yes, more than. Perfect. There's me in the chat. And then Chelsea is the same just with our last names. But yeah, she's the one that you're going to want to talk to about the yield warranty program. I don't know, Molly, why would he say that sounds like insurance? Or what do you think? I don't know that program very well, to be honest. Um, Sounds like there's no good reason not to do it. <laughs> um, maybe it's another thing to do, right? He's just like, I, I, one more thing, another program for me to worry about, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah. Please reach out to us if it feels like we're not doing a great job answering this question. We'd love to talk to you more uh, in depth. Yeah. You're welcome to email me um, or Chelsea or Morgan uh, in the process, and hopefully we can figure it out from there. And Chelsea is great. She just said for the yield warranty program, you are required to also have crop insurance. She added that to the okay. chat. Oh, great. Thank you. Great. Well, I think we have time for one last question, Emma. I don't have anything in my queue, so. Okay, great. Well, I just want to thank everybody today for jo joining us. Um, we hope that we answered some questions and hope that we uh, demystified some of what may be happening uh, out in your fields. Just a reminder that my name is Martha McFarland. Um, if you have any interest in working with Molly on our landowner coaching program, which is a chance for you to talk one-on-one -on -one about your farm and learn a little bit more about it, um, you can email me at martha.mcfarland at practicalfarmers.org. Um, that would also be a great way for you to sign up for our landowners newsletter, which is something that we send out quarterly. Uh, and pretty soon, I would say in the next month, we're going to be um, lining up our field guide, um, which is any and all field days that we have going on uh, across the state of Iowa. And we certainly welcome you at any one of those programs. As we finish up today, you are going to get a link. Uh, to send out a survey um, to give us some feedback on today's program. That's really helpful for us in start because it helps us um, really recognize um, and um, measure um, the work that we're doing here, which can help us secure more grants for more opportunities for educational programming. And most importantly, we really want this to be valuable to you and we want to make sure that we are serving your needs. So if you can fill that out as you leave, I would be very grateful. And with that, I think that we will conclude our program today. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks especially to our panel. Everybody have a great day.